thanks a lot. What I'm going to talk to you about this evening is multiplicity and subgroups. So it's a, it's a talk that we use inside a course teaching people about how to do a randomized trial. And this particular element of that course is about things to be really careful when you're doing a randomized trial or when you're using somebody else's randomized trial. So really, the subtitle is Multiplicity and Subgroups Beware. And hopefully you're going to leave after this evening's talk with a sense of what you should be careful about. What you should not do as a trialist, what you should be careful about when you read somebody else's trial, and what you should be careful about when you use somebody else's trial in, for example, a systematic review. So what can go wrong? Why can it go wrong? How can we try and stop it from going wrong? So the first point that we have to think about on multiplicity, and multiplicity is about doing many analyses, looking at the data in many different ways. The more you look, the more you find. And of course that's true, that's true of you know, everything we do in, in our lives. If we don't have a look for something, well, we can't possibly expect to find it. The problem that we have from the statistics of doing trials and then of doing reviews is the more we look, the more we will find false positives. And we really do not want to conclude that something works when it really doesn't work. That could be a waste of resources. It could actually prove, out to be harm, prove to be harmful. But it could get in the way of something that really is effective. So we have to say to ourselves, how likely is it that the mathematics we've used to analyze a study have actually led to a false positive? So many of us will be familiar with the idea of uh, a statistical significance test with a p-value of 0.05. And if it's below a p-value of 0.05, which means 1 in 20, then we might say that it's not due to chance, it's real. Something happening one time in 20 doesn't mean we wait 90, if we just do 19, we're fine. Don't, don't do the 20th. If you do the 20th, you might be in trouble. So just do 19 and you'll be fine. As long as you do 19 or less, you'll be fine. Well, there's a very interesting way of thinking about that that shows it's wrong. Of course, the first one could go wrong. The first one could be a false positive. But if we look at this graph, and this graph says, if I do many, many tests, what happens to the probability of actually finding one statistically significant result when absolutely nothing is going on. What happens to that chance? So if we do many tests from one test, 11, 21, I mean they're just in the, in the tens, when does it become more likely than not that I will claim a statistically significant result when there really is nothing going on? When I will think I've got a positive result and it's actually a false positive result. That's at the halfway point, when the probability is 0.5. And if we take that arrow down to the bottom line, 12 or 13 tests, as soon as you've done 12 or 13 tests, you're now in the territory that probability is saying to you, you're more likely than not to see a false positive when nothing's going on. And again, we don't have to wait. We don't have to do, you know, if we do 10, we're fine. If we do 12 or 13 tests, we're more likely than not to end up with a false positive when nothing's going on. So what we now have to do is we have to think, yeah, okay, but can we get things wrong the first time? Or can we be really good at predicting things the first time? And this is where you know, I need some help now from the audience. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and work out what are the chances that I can pre-select one of these cards. So we've got a pack of cards um, here. It's a, a new pack of cards. Let's get rid of all the rubbish. Um, at the end, and it's a, a you know it's unshuffled at the moment. So what I'm going to try and do is pick one of the cards out from the pack, and then see if I can have actually predicted a card that is going to be chosen by by a, another route. I can't you know of course match the same card because there's only one card uh, of each type in the pack. What we first of all need to do is shuffle the deck. So I need a volunteer. So I need someone on the front row who thinks they're reasonably good at shuffling a deck of cards. Yep, okay. So I'm just going to come down, and in case it helps, you can use the table. So you can you know, do whatever you, you think to shuffle the deck of cards. Now, one of the um, relevances of this to those of us who work in randomized trials 
is that we might use shuffled envelopes or shuffled cards in order to organize the randomization sequence that we might use. So what we're going to do is once we've had the, the shuffle, do you think you're a good shuffler? Okay, those of you around, do you think, it would, I mean, he hasn't even used the table. Did we think it would be a bit of this going, <laughs> that's what I was expecting, that's why I gave him the table. Or maybe he was so good he wouldn't need to use the table. Let's just have a little look. Do you want to just give me the cards? Yeah, sure. Now, so I'm just going to have a look and see if they're fairly well shuffled. They're not fairly well shuffled. Do you want to have another go or should we go? I mean, if I can show people, they're still sort of bunched up. They're still bunching together. I need it a bit more shuffled. Uh, okay. Do you want the table? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so one of, the, one of the important points of this is when this talk is part of the randomized trial um, course, is to make people think very hard about how to get things in random orders. That was a bit, that's looking good. Okay, it's, it, because if we just, I mean, and there is a mathematical theory, anyone know the number of shuffles that you need on a deck of cards to, to actually break most of the sequences within it? Anybody know what it is? Seven. seven. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, seven good shuffles uh, will, will make it random in its order. Let's just have a little look then. Let me take these out. Okay, that's a little bit better. That's a little bit better. Now we can see that there's a nice uh, variety of things in there. So what I'm going to do is I've picked a card out now. Okay. I'm going to actually put this card under this lovely little trap door that I discovered earlier. <laughs> okay? Um, you can't see what's on there. I could have a little chap under there. Uh, okay? What we need now is I need another volunteer, and this volunteer has to be able to do two things. They have to be able to count to reach a number between 10 and 20, and they have to be able to do it quietly. You have to be able to count silently in your head. Front row, a volunteer. You've got to, you're going to count some cards out onto the table, stopping between 10 and 20. We look at the front row. Do we have a volunteer? Thank you. Okay. So again, this is why the table is there. Okay, so what you have to do is just take the pack from the top. You just count them. You keep them face down. You stop somewhere between 10 and 20, counting it yourself. It's up to you where you stop. Face down, one on top of the other. And I, I, won't, I won't look. Go on, away you go. I've started looking. <laughs> but I don't know how many you've done. Okay, you stop when you're ready, somewhere between 10 and 20. You stopped? Okay. Let's take those back. So, now we now need is someone who can cross-check that pack. Let's put those away. Um, just to... I need to make that pack into two little piles now. So who can do that for me? Again, who on the front row? All you're going to do is you're just going to take them. Okay, so what you have to do now is you just take the pack like that and you keep them face down. And so you go A, B, A, B, just like that, alternating. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Were you counting? How many were there? Seven, each, Seven in each. Fourteen, is that yeah. correct? So nobody's fiddled with it. So what we now have to do is say, could I predict a card? What I want you to do is just take the top card off each pile. Just take the top card off each. Hold those cards up. Show the cards to the camera. Tell me what the cards, say what the cards are. Uh, Jack of Diamonds and okay. Ace of Hearts. Jack of Diamonds and the Ace of Hearts. Now I couldn't possibly have the Ace of Hearts or the Jack of Diamonds under here because they're there. But what I could do to give me twice as many chances is have a mixture of those two cards under here. Just hold them up again and tell people what they are. They're the... It's the Jack of Diamonds okay. and the Ace of Hearts. So it's the Ace of Hearts and the Jack of Diamonds. So it's the Ace of Diamonds. I did have, to, you know, I, but how many chances did I have to get that one right? One in 52. Well, it's not quite one in 52. I, I, I hedged my bets a bit. I had one in 26. So that's not bad. So, can I predict things in advance? Before I do the trial, can I predict what the outcome of the trial is going to be? Well, maybe I can. 
or maybe I just got lucky, that's a 1 in 26, that's less than a 0.05 p-value. So, first of all, be care we want to be careful. So our multiplicity, and so, so the idea is, is to make you think really hard, you're trying to figure out how that was done. But the element of that that you need to take away is this stuff. You need to limit the number of analyses that you do. I only did one, and I still got lucky. Or did I get lucky? We'll see later. You need to choose those analyses carefully, and you need to make each one count. If you waste an analysis, if you do an analysis that's unnecessary, that's still contributing to the probability that you're going to get a false positive somewhere else. So we just have to use them carefully. And also, it's really important to remember, if we do an analysis that we think is unnecessary but we like its result, maybe suddenly it becomes necessary and suddenly we decide to highlight it. And suddenly you want to go home and tell people about this wonderful magic trick you saw uh, earlier. Because so, if it hadn't worked, would you tell anybody about it? No, maybe, yeah. yeah. So make each one count. Now we have to move on to subgroups. Subgroups are an even bigger problem for us because we could do multiple tests, but we can slice our data in all sorts of different ways. We can say, well, let's have a look at the men and women separately. Oh, okay, that's very interesting. Well, let's look at the different age groups in men and women separately. And then why don't we have a little look at some different blood pressure ranges? And also, why don't we have a little look at whether or not they're smokers or not smokers? So there are so many different ways. And before we know it, we could be up into 30, 40, 50, 100 subgroup analyses. So we're way, way beyond 12 or 13, more likely than not. We're actually getting up into the territory where we could have a p-value that appears really, really convincing. And it's purely chance, because we did so many tests. So what I'm going to talk about here is the need for a cautious analysis of the subgroups. We have to think very hard in a scientific way about should the subgroups test or generate hypotheses. So if I get a really interesting finding, should I just say, OK, change practice now? Or should I say, that's interesting, we really should test that in a new study? Which is better, the individual or the collective result? I'm going to show you some graphs to help tease some of this out. And lumping or splitting of data in reviews. Should we actually put everybody together or should we keep everybody apart? And then the final point, don't ignore chance effects. And again, I'll, I'll tell you what that means properly towards the end. So we then, let's just take one step backwards. Why do we do these trials and reviews in the first place? Again, remember, this, is, you know, this, this talk really is in the context of trying to get people to do better studies. Why we do big trials and systematic reviews of trials is because the effects of the different interventions that we're testing might not be very different for the major outcomes but it would be worth knowing about those moderate differences. To get that knowledge, then we've got to do good research. <coughs> and that research needs to be based on the large-scale randomised evidence because that says that these two groups, let's say a group receiving aspirin and a group receiving placebo, that these two groups differ only by the chance process of whether or not they were allocated to aspirin or placebo. They do not differ because of their clinical characteristics. They do not differ because of their uh, underlying propensity to have certain outcomes. Those have been balanced out by the randomization. But we're trying to pick up the moderate difference. If it's a big difference, then we can live with a bit of bias. If everybody isn't going to get better and we give them a tablet and 80% of them get better, well, that tablet's done something. If usually most people get better in about 48 hours, some people get better a bit quicker, but everybody now gets better in about 24 hours. Again, something is going on. We don't need large-scale randomized evidence to show that. But maybe every, most people are better at 48 hours, and we think, can we get most people better at, say, um, 36 hours? We might need a large trial to do that because of the noise. that Some people get better very quickly, some people very slowly. We're trying to pick up moderate differences. So how do we reduce the effects of chance? Well, we just study more. But we still we have to be careful. Chance can catch us out even the first time. But what happens if we then smash all of that fantastic data apart? This is a made-up example. 